Well, everyone, thank you and welcome to the Harvard Law Forum. We're very glad to have you here. Uh, logistics first, pizza is being passed down and plates are coming soon. Um, and uh, hope that gets settled and hope, uh, hope you all get your pizza before my, my intro is done. Uh, I'm Pete Davis. I'm a 3L here at the law school and the chair of the Harvard Law Forum. Let's begin by thanking our co-sponsors. Who here is from the wonderful Harvard Legal Aid Bureau? Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, let's hear it for you. Who here is from the American Constitution Society? Anyone here from the American Constitution Society? Thank you so much for coming at Harvard Debs. Thank you for publicizing as well. I'd also like to thank our newest members of the forum, Emily Lorand and Caroline Schinkel, who helped us get our wonderful guests to the right place here today. For 70 years, thanks to a donation from the Rappaport family, a very generous Boston family, the Rappaports. We have Jonathan Rappaport here today. Uh, the Harvard Law Forum has been bringing speakers to campus to remind students what is happening outside of the Cambridge bubble. Sometimes that means Eleanor Roosevelt, or Billy Graham, or Cesar Chavez, or Martin Luther King Jr. Sometimes it means Dr. Ruth, or wrestling magnate Vince McMahon, or LSD innovator Timothy Leary. Joining this motley crew today are these two folks. Uh, Talking about a subject from the former category of speakers, not the latter category of speakers. Um, they are representatives Susan W. Brooks and Joe Kennedy III, the bipartisan duo behind the Congressional Access to Civil Legal Services Caucus. As former legal practitioners themselves, they are vigorous advocates for increased funding for the Legal Services Corporation, the federal program established to distribute civil legal aid grants. They're going to speak soon about their time fighting for access to justice in the halls of Congress, but before they speak, I just want to take a few minutes to explain why I invited them here today to get us in the mood uh, for the importance of this issue. Um, I've spent my time at the forum focused on our law school mission statement, which is to educate leaders who contribute to the advancement of justice and the well-being of society. We've had a series of events around this mission statement. We've published this book, Our Bicentennial Crisis, A Call to Action for Harvard Law School's Public Interest Mission, to lay out, uh, and they're in the back uh, on your way out, to lay out how our school can better live up to this mission. It's a good mission to have because all lawyers must have this mission. Um, as you can recite from memory, Canon 8 of the ABA Model Code of Professional Ethics says, um, don't worry, you don't have to, I'll have it on the screen. Changes in human affairs and imperfections in human institutions make necessary constant efforts to maintain and improve our legal system. The system should function in a manner that commands public respect. Lawyers are especially qualified for this. They should propose legislation to improve the system. Now we have to ask ourselves, we have to take this seriously as a canon. Are we having a legal system today that commands public respect? And if not, should we be participating in proposing legislation to improve the system? There's one guy uh, here who really cared about this. His name is Judge Learned Hand. He's from the Harvard class of 96, 1896. Uh, he said, if we are to keep our democracy, there must be one commandment, thou shalt not ration justice. And if we were to look learned hand in the face and ask him, are we rationing justice today? And we had to be honest, look at him in the face. We had to be honest. We're, we are. Uh, Four-fifths of civil legal needs go unmet. Some people estimate 86% of civil legal needs of the poor go unmet. One out of every $100 is spent on the bottom seventh of, only one out of $100 spent on the bottom seventh of the population. They measured a World Justice Project, compared us to other countries in terms of accessibility to civil legal justice. 23 countries ranked, it's like Family Feud survey says, US is 20th of 23. Uh, 66 countries ranked in terms of the ability to obtain legal counsel. We are 50th of 66. This is a crisis around the country. Civil legal aid in Cleveland turned away 57. In Philadelphia, 95% turned away. In Maryland, they have to close early every day because of the volume of people who need civil legal aid and not enough lawyers. In New York, 2.3 million New Yorkers navigate proceedings without a lawyer. An ABA chair put it best. Any local aid office around the country will tell you two-thirds of those who walk through the doors aren't getting help because there aren't enough 
services. What does this look like to real people? It's mothers getting kicked out of their homes when they had a right to stay there. It's domestic violence victims not getting restraining orders in a timely fashion. It's elders being abused by their caretakers. It's veterans not getting their benefits. Rights need lawyers. Without our class of 58, Ralph Nader said, Rights need remedies, but remedies need facilities. If you have a right to a redress of grievance, it means nothing without the remedy of being able to sue. If you have the remedy of being able to sue, it means nothing without the facility of having a lawyer. Powell versus Alabama. In court, declaration by a, a judge. Right to be heard in legal proceedings means nothing without the right to be heard by counsel. Our own Lark Turner in the class of 2018 put it bluntly, where there are no lawyers, there is no constitution. So if you care about the Constitution, you have to care about this issue that these two folks are fighting for. Everyone's rights are everyone's rights, even if you're someone who can't afford a lawyer. Professor Rohde said, law is a public good. When someone has their rights protected, we all get our rights protected. Our own de uh, former Dean Martha Minow, who's fought very hard for civil legal aid, reminds us that you put a dollar into the system, you get $5 back, 2 to $5 back. Let's give an example of that, wage theft. Uh, it's one of the largest property crime categories in America. 20 to $50 billion is stolen from employees a year. Why does this allowed to happen? There's no cops on the beat. Civil legal aid lawyers are private law enforcement officers. If you care about law and order, you gotta care about what these two folks are fighting for. Finally, we have a, you know, this is at the center of orderly uh, government. If you don't have rights, you don't have an orderly government anymore. And that's why I brought these folks here today, because they know that responsibility is the ability to respond and they know we have an ability to respond and thus a responsibility about this issue. They know that we're losing out in per capita income to other countries and we have a responsibility to catch up. They know that when the legal system, when the top 200 American law firms are doing civil legal aid for the powerful and gaining $96.3 billion in revenue for that, and legal aid for the poor from all sources is only $1.3 billion, we have to fight for equal justice under law. They know that when the top 100 most profitable law firms make $30 billion in profits a year and Legal Services Corporation is lagging at that, they know we have to fight to change that. They know that when the Legal Services Corporation is not even at its peak funding, that it's been down 25%, that legal service funded lawyers are still having to turn away 50% of people. They know we have a responsibility uh, to fight that. And that's why we called them here today. And we're so glad to have them here to tell us about fighting for access to justice in the halls of Congress and what you can do to help them out with that. So without further ado, let's uh, hear from one of the co-founders of the Bipartisan Caucus, Representative Susan Brooks of the great state of Indiana. Thank you, Pete. Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay, outstanding. It is wonderful to be here, and thank you so much for the warm welcome. I have to admit, it's my second time being to Harvard. My first time was as a brand new member of Congress, elected in November of 2012. I came to the Kennedy School of Government to the new, the freshman school for new members of Congress, where I met your alum, Joe Kennedy. And uh, so it's a bipartisan program, in case you don't know, that Harvard puts on through the Kennedy School of Government. And I was thrilled to be here then, and I'm thrilled to be here now. Um, I, I do want to share with you, and thank you, Pete, for that incredible, Joe and I were just saying, you need to come to Congress and help us educate our caucus members about your presentation, much more visually stimulating and I think better than what you might hear from the two of us. We aren't big into you know, those type of, of visual aids, even though we might have been as trial lawyers, which we both were at one point in our career. But I have to tell you, I'm here to talk about uh, something that Joe and I are both passionate about, and that's access to civil legal services. Because I think as the pictures demonstrated, and thank you, pictures do you know, tell a thousand words. And you already put up the statistics, so I'm not going to go through those again. But what I did bring up, and what I wanted to share with you, is something that Legal Services Corporation just finished, and they unveiled last year, and it's called the Justice Gap Report. And your own dean, Dean Minow, um, was instrumental. She's vice chair of Legal uh, Services Corporation and one of an 11-person board uh, confirmed by the Senate, presidential appointments, and they put together an incredible report which I encourage you to read and to find. So I'm not going to go through the statistics, but what we know 
is that the type of work that legal service corporation lawyers and those who are involved in legal aid do help people, things like evictions, foreclosures, veterans who are homeless, veterans who have issues with their jobs. They, have, they help uh, people get their federal benefits that they might be entitled to. They work on immigration issues. They help domestic violence victims. In fact, we just as a caucus hosted an event for colleagues on the Hill and their staffs to learn about how legal aid helps domestic violence victims leave their abuser. Um, and as you may or may not know, it's on average seven to 11 times before someone who's been abused will actually finally leave that abuser. That's because they're worried about where they're going to live, how they're gonna take care of their families, what kind of health insurance they're gonna have. Um, but also I think one of the other things that people go to legal services for, which I think is when it comes to the most personal issues possible, it's the potential loss of custody of a child. And so a lot of times people, you know, one in seven people who are in the appropriate, in the lower income level of Americans will face a legal problem each year. Think about that. So one in seven will face a legal challenge. Now many of them, they don't even realize it is a legal challenge. But where they often turn to is when it has to do with divorces and children or with wills or, and things like that. They often don't even realize they have legal challenges and that they can turn to a lawyer for those challenges. I have to tell you, Pete's right. There are not enough civil legal aid resources to go around. Um, Congress does appropriate and uh, to the tune of about 300, between 300 and 385 million a year. And that's what I would suspect will be appropriated this year. Um, but quite frankly, that's not nearly enough. And so how are we as a society going to change? I don't think there will ever be enough federal funding, even at the level when it was at its highest, which was in the 400 millions. So what do we as a society do to make sure that people do have equal access to justice. And that's what this is called, the justice gap. So I will tell you, it is going to have to be supplemented by other groups, whether it is pro bono clinics, whether it is law student organizations. In fact, I was really pleased to just hear, University of Buffalo Law School are training law students to go down to Puerto Rico. Because think of all of the citizens of Puerto Rico without power, without going to their jobs any longer, without having homes right now, think of the legal problems that are going to stem from that crisis down in Puerto Rico. And Buffalo is training, Buffalo Law School is training students to take a clinic 10 day, 14 day program down to Puerto Rico to help um, those citizens, help our citizens with their legal challenges. But I have to tell you, it's gonna take organizations and one of the things that we do um, and what the, I think the best legal services organizations do is they find a way to pair with other nonprofit organizations to help that client with, their, with many of their problems because usually their legal problem is just one issue in their lives. Let me give you an example. Um, recently I met with what is called Neighborhood Christian Legal Services in Indiana. They partner with a group called Hoosier Veterans Assistance Foundation. Now a lawyer from Neighborhood Christian Legal Services did something really amazing for a veteran, a veteran named Roger, a Vietnam veteran, who lost his home due to a foreclosure, lost his job, and became homeless. It is because of the Hoosier Assistance Veteran Foundation that they reached out to Neighborhood Christian Legal Service Clinic and formed a partnership to help this veteran. Because the veteran, while they helped him get a job, this veteran now had this foreclosure hanging over his head and his new employer was garnishing a good amount of his wages. And so because of the work of the lawyer, they filed bankruptcy, obviously uh, allowed in this country for individuals such as that, filed the bankruptcy, allowed this man, Roger, to have a fresh start in life. That would never have happened but for the work of the Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic. And so it is partnering, and that's what I think is critically important, that we think about, yes, the importance of putting federal resources because they provide, provide a foundation, but partnering with the nonprofit organizations that many of you are familiar with, whether it's domestic violence organizations, whether it's organizations for the disabled, whether it is organizations that support veterans or low-income housing. That is how we're gonna make a difference. That's how we're going to multiply, whether we are creating partnerships 
um, and help all of the people that need our help. Um, I'm really proud to have partnered with your alum, Joe Kennedy, uh, representing Massachusetts 4th Congressional District. I represent the 5th in Indiana, which, by the way, is Indianapolis into the north. Any Hoosiers in the room? Just out of curiosity. All right, where are you from? Um, I'm from Indianapolis, your representative. All right, good. <laughs> so happy. I should have started with that, shouldn't I? So uh, wonderful. Where do, uh, anyway, we'll talk later. Uh, sorry, but you know now, what's your name? Oh, awesome. Okay. That's even better. Okay. She probably knows stories. Were you ever at my home for any reason? Uh, so um, anyway, that could be a whole nother story. Uh, yes, my kids are 24 and 27 and uh, North Central proud. I'm a proud North Central mom. But uh, so great to have you here. But we have incredible services, but Legal Services Corporation is the foundation. And we formed the Access to Legal Services um, caucus and what caucuses do in Congress is we educate the staffers, we educate other members of Congress, and we provide forums and discussions very much like this on the Hill so that we can educate. We led letters to the appropriators because it's the appropriators that fund programs in federal government. And so Joe and I have led letters to try to encourage our appropriators to fund the appropriate level. Um, and it's not appropriate, okay? It's, it's barely adequate. But it's important, and it's important that we advocate for this. Um, and it, it's tough during, budget, during tough budget times, but it's critically important. But it's also important that we think about how are we going to do this different. Federal government in and of itself is never going to be the sole funder of these services. And so as I'm looking at the brightest minds in the country in legal education, what part of the profession as you go out into after you graduate from this place, whether or not you are going into the private sector and when you're in the law firms, large and small, you will probably be asked, if not required, by your state bars to perform pro bono services. Don't think of it as a chore. Don't think of it at, think of it as what our responsibility is as lawyers to give back and to help. And you might be like I was, a criminal defense lawyer. And if you get asked, okay, what do I know about foreclosures? Or what do I know about divorces? We all know a lot more than that individual that has that problem. And so you can, with the help of colleagues and with the help of people involved with civil legal aid or involved with clinics, you can be an incredible voice for low-income Americans and what they need. And so I am just hoping that you will challenge yourselves to think about, regardless of wherever you go, whether it's public service or private, uh, the private sector when you leave here, that you think about how you're going to give back, how you're going to make an impact in your firm, in your corporation, in the small practice you might begin, or in, or in public service. How can you make sure that you give back and help so we do have equal justice for all? Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear it for Representative Susan Brooks, a great message. Now we bring on uh, our own alum, uh, Representative Joe Kennedy III. Pete, thanks. Um, if I knew everything that you said, I knew I'd be a smart guy. Um, so uh, incredible introduction. Thank you for sh shaping uh, this issue and framing it so well. Um, I'm going to try to keep these comments pretty short to just engage everybody in the conversation. Uh, wary of doing that as a politician with a whole bunch of Harvard Law students. So, <laughs> um, last time I was in this room was for Elizabeth Warren's bankruptcy class, and I sat right over there, and it was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> every day, just white knuckle hoping you didn't get called on, and every day she called me. <laughs> um, so, uh, hopefully, this goes better for me than that class did. Um, but really thrilled to be here with all of you. Really thrilled to see so many people here. Um, a couple of shout outs uh, that I want to uh, give. Um, first, to um, an incredible human being, an incredible advocate for civil rights, for social justice, um, somebody who has done an incredible job of leading Harvard Law School, Martha Minow. I don't know where you went. She, uh, as Representative Brooks said, um, has been one of the leading voices on access to justice, was one of the chairs of that report, um, and has really pushed uh, us across society, certainly in Congress and other ways, to try to do exactly what Susan was talking about, about trying to figure out where we can find additional synergies and how we can leverage technology, additional resources, institutions, to actually addressing this issue, because we're not going to be able to come up with the federal dollars that we need, although we need to do more than we are. Um, second, um, Susan Brooks, uh, 
Folks, I cannot tell you how critical it has been to have a stalwart uh, conservative voice as part of this coalition. Legal services oftentimes gets lumped into an anti-poverty program, and it is that, but it's, in my mind, a pretty strong constitutionalist and, and conservative argument to make sure that the laws apply equally to everybody. In order for us to make that point more persuasively, uh, we need some Republicans that are, are willing to speak from experience and can step up and make that case, and Susan has done so day in and day out, and I'm so grateful to you. your leadership on this, and thank you. And finally, one last point of personal privilege. Um, a good friend of mine um, who I uh, had tried for a really long time to suggest that uh, going to law school was going to be a huge detriment to her career because she was working for me, ended up going to Harvard Law School and she's in the back. So, Caroline. <laughs> and finally, um, because she's family, um, my sister in law's here. Hi, Kate. Um, so a couple of things. One, you've heard the stats, you've heard Susan Brooks talk about um, some of the political dynamics and, and some of the challenges we're up against. I'm not going to go through all of that again, but I will put a little bit of uh, my own personal spin on it. And this is something that um, I came to uh, in a personal way through my time at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. So to those bureau folks that are here, um, thanks for what you do, thanks for your interest, thanks for coming, and um, thank you for con continuing to serve. Uh, folks in at-risk communities in Boston, underserved communities in and around Boston that desperately, desperately, desperately need help. Um, I'll give you one quick story um, from one of my clients uh, that helped me realize just how big a challenge this is. I'll, I'll call her Sarah, uh, just for confidentiality purposes, but she was an uh, African-American woman that had, if I remember correctly, two high school age children, might have been three, um, when I became her student representative. She had uh, lived in, uh, I think, Dorchester and Mattapan, um, in an apartment, uh, paying rent. And the home got foreclosed on, and she got kicked out. The servicer of the mortgage that came in said that she had to leave, which is not true. Um, she didn't know what else to do, so she picked her kids up and left. Um, found another apartment, started paying rent. A year later, the same thing happened. And she said, look, I, I can't do this to my kids in the middle of the school year twice in two years. I just can't. So she stayed. And then the harassment began. And the, the bullying, the intimidation to try to get her to leave. She ended up going out uh, to get groceries one day and came back and the servicer had changed the locks on her door. Um, she was locked out of her house. She, the fire department knocked down the door to get her back in. Her son, one of them happened to be walking home as they knocked down the door. Um, he struggled with mental health issues. He had a uh, mental health issue a couple days later in school. He was a football player. It was his fall of his junior year. It was his recruiting season. And um, he lost out and he lost out great. And you then have this, this woman trying to figure out how she's going to keep a roof over her head, trying to figure out how she's going to care for her, her child that is in the midst of some serious mental health issues, how she's supposed to care for her other kids, how she's supposed to try to make ends meet and continue to pay her more. And she didn't know what else to do, and she didn't know where else to go. And so she ended up in one of these foreclosure clinics and got referred to the Harvard Legal Aid. And I had no idea what I was doing. Thankfully, somebody else really did. Um, <laughs> and we started chipping away at this. Um, and ultimately, after months, we're able to um, go into mediation and um, get her a place to live um, for the foreseeable future, and a trust fund set aside to try to meet the needs of her child. Yeah. But folks, if you, if you can imagine what that must be like for a single parent trying to navigate three essential things that you have to balance at once, a job, a house, and your kids, and knowing that at some point, given her circumstance, you had to sacrifice one for the other, which of those do you cut? Because there's no slack there. And then you're forced to navigate through a legal system where you could lose essentially, potentially all of them. And you're on your own. And it's completely incompetent. And in that complexity is where, there's one lesson I've learned from Congress, is the more complex the system, the greater the chance are that you're getting screwed. 
for so many people. And the system is complex. And the people that lose out are the folks that can least afford it. And that's the structural inequity that, that legal aid seeks to try to address. To make sure that everybody has access. You're never going to get equal representation, but at least to some sort of adequate representation so you can navigate yourself and your, your, your family through the rights that legislatures or courts have fought so hard to actually establish and protect. And that's why I would echo Susan Paul and just say, one, thank you for your interest. Thank you for being here. Thank you for calling attention to this. Pete, thanks for writing a book about it. Um, I didn't write a book when I was in law school. Um, you did. I'm impressed. Um, thank you all for, for making sure that this isn't something that just gets pushed off to the sidelines. Uh, Pete highlighted the, the funding equities there. Just to put that in perspective, Americans, we as a society, spent $150 million more on the Conor McGregor fight than we did on LSE funding. On pay-per-view, in one night. In 2014, we as a society spent more money on Halloween costumes for our pets, <laughs> for our pets, than funds for basic field grants for legal services. This isn't a question of adequacy. It's not even close. This is a question of trying to make sure that people's rights are actually protected and celebrated the same way that yours or mine would be if we have them, and the same way that you fight for them. So um, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, so grateful for Susan and the work that she's done as we seek to make this case that this is, while well, it is, an issue of economic mobility and anti-poverty is also an issue of profound constitutional uh, rights and a, a strict conservative argument as well. Um, look forward to your questions, your suggestions, your thoughts, um, and how we can uh, help uh, continue with the case. Yeah. Thank you. Let's keep it going for Representative Joe Kennedy. so much for those two uh, great talks. Um, now we move on to discussion, okay. Um, I wanna start with this, because I think many people in the audience as law students are starting their vocations. You know, this is the final uh, escape from your real life that you can pull. Okay, I'm gonna law school, it'll delay by three years, and then you have to start making some decisions. And this I- This your idea of how to escape from real life. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I love, um, yeah, no, we could have gone to this one. I'd love to hear your stories a bit about how you were thinking about what inspired you to go into public service eventually from a legal career, um, how you thought about your role as a lawyer when you were young, and how you decided, you know, when you're in Congress and you can work on, you, you have to prioritize, you only can prioritize a handful of issues and why you chose this one. So a little bit of the narrative of your stories. I am much older than Joe, so my story is a little bit longer, but as I was just sharing with Emily as I walked in, right after law school, I went into criminal defense as a practice. And as a criminal defense attorney, I also did some federal defender work. And um, then after, um, after 13 years in criminal defense, um, working with low income, but not just, I was a private criminal defense attorney, so I represented people of all socioeconomic means. Um, but then I went to work for Mayor Steve Goldsmith, who happens to be um, here at the Kennedy School of Government now. Um, he is a chair at the Kennedy School. Um, he is one of the um, leaders in the country on innovation in government, and in local and state government in particular. But I became a member of the Federal Public Defender Board uh, during that time, and uh, then had to step off when I became U.S. Attorney. Now, because obviously we have cases against the U.S. Attorney's Office. When I came to Congress, um, Suzanne Bonamici of Oregon was fighting for federal defender funding. And she came to me and said, I know you've been involved as a federal public defender. Can you help us make the case? As well as a federal judge, who I'm very close to, Sarah Evans Barker, said we need to make sure that programs like federal defender programs and legal services programs are funded you go be that voice. And um, right before coming to Congress, my last job as a lawyer was I was senior counsel, I was general counsel for our state's community college system. And so I was in higher ed law where clinics would come and visit the community college on a regular basis and meet with our students, many who were of, uh, of lesser means than probably most of you, 
and they often had legal issues. And they were in school just like you, um, but they were at the community college system. And I saw the incredible services that legal aid provided our students at the community college. And so that's how I ended up. Um, but honestly, it was Joe who found me um, on the floor, I think our second term, and said, we need to do a better job fighting for funding for LSC. And so I just want to uh, tip my hat to, you know, to Joe for his advocacy. I had seen it on the criminal side that I was so familiar with, but he's the one who said, I need your help, let's go fight on this. And so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So um, I kind of came through a, a big piece of this was obviously my experience in the Legal Aid Bureau. I was a Peace Corps volunteer before coming to law school. And uh, <laughs> we got one. Um, and um, one L a year can be kind of tough. Um, for those of you in it, it gets better. Um, it was an extraordinary change from, from uh, being out in the Peace Corps to being in a Harvard Law classroom. And the, uh, I found the intellectual discussions here um, hard to keep up with and fascinating. Um, but sometimes there was also uh, a lack of a bit of that texture that you are confronted with day to day in the Peace Corps. You're not so much debating legal theory as you are trying to make sure that the people you serve have a, a meal. And I, my experience in the Peace Corps helped me understand that I wanted to learn more about how the law works and how it doesn't to try to address some of these injustices in our society. And I found those kind of philosophical conversations in a classroom fascinating, but left me wanting a little bit more of that texture. And as I looked around for where you could get it, uh, the Bureau was certainly that place. They, uh, they told us, as I'm sure the Bureau students have told you, that it's like a 20 hour week commitment and it's not so much time and you certainly have a life outside of that in class. <laughs> not true. <laughs> Blatantly not true. Um, but it was a way that you actually got to see how our system of justice works in the civil side and how it doesn't. And it was that experience in a courtroom that actually uh, got me interested and uh, pushed me to become a, a, a state prosecutor here in Massachusetts as an assistant district attorney in a couple of different counties uh, here uh, across the Commonwealth. And those experiences built on each other. And again, um, it's a system of justice, and the vast majority of folks in that are working really hard to do the right thing every single day. It, it's also a human system. And so we see those shortcomings and you see those failures. And some of those are structural in the way the laws work. Some of them are human and just the, the odd ways that somehow the, the, the die are, are cast. But you can't be exposed to some of that and then not recognize pretty clearly that that system is certainly uh, unequal. And you're never going to make it fully equal. But you can do a better job to make sure that folks um, that were getting a short end of that stick for a complex series of reasons have the tools to at least get a fairer shot. Uh, and um, when I was ended up getting into to office, and one of the reasons why I ran were actually was because we were, I was prosecuting an awful lot of domestic violence cases. And an awful lot of drug cases, particularly prescription drugs and then heroin, um, for kids that were sick, uh, people that were sick. And we were locking them up because that's what the law basically says structured you to do. Although, sending somebody to jail for six months or a year because they're addicted to heroin without addressing a heroin addiction doesn't solve the problem at all. Um, and so when I got into office, it was kind of an obvious thing to say, okay, well, if you want to try out to continue that work, um, access to justice and legal services is a, is a good way to go. And you also realize just how far, I mean, dressing up dogs in Halloween costumes is cute, but like, if that's where we are as a society, we, we could be doing an awful lot better. Thank you for those messages. The two things I drew from that is one is having direct experience with the people around the country and seeing with your own eyes the needs that folks have, and two, uh, being asked by someone to help, which is something we don't think. You know, just go to asking someone to help, you'll never be surprised who will join you. Um, and uh, you'll be a bit surprised by who will join you. A second question, and I got a text from, is your mic on? One, one second. On that. Before you go yeah. to that, can I just encourage, for those of you who don't participate in the Bureau for the Legal, is that what it's yeah. called here? Bureau for Legal Aid? Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. Now. Better now? Hey, how about that? What I said earlier, um, you don't have to have an area of expertise to be a part of that. 
you all are far more expert just starting out of the gates. You have access to research. You have access to experts. You have access to you know, the professors and those who supervise the clinic. Um, and I, I would strongly encourage you to consider, if you haven't done it, uh, to consider doing it. Because I think only a few hands actually went up when uh, that question was asked. And um, you will be rewarded so much personally, and it's usually those clinics that you participate in that really, as you know, Joe said, contextualize the theory and that really help you m maybe even find a new passion in the law that you didn't realize you had. Um, and so I would strongly, strongly encourage you to consider uh, volunteering. What a great message. There's a professor here that says, hope is not the cause of action. Action is the cause of hope. You just got to get started. Mm -hmm. And what a great message on that. One more question for me, and then we'll open up to the audience if we have um, time. Uh, I as, as you are advocating for this issue in Congress, we call this fighting for access to justice in the halls of Congress. So I want to get one in the halls of Congress question um, in. I assume when you're talking to your parties, you have different challenges. So Representative Kennedy, your challenge is getting your party to prioritize it uh, over the, you know, all the issues that they could prioritize on this. And Representative Brooks, your challenge is to say that this is something that could fit conservative values as well to your party. And I'd love to hear how you talk with your colleagues about this issue, what pushback you get, how, what messaging breaks through, and how when we're trying to lobby Congress for this, uh, what message would break through? So, um, PJ, it's a great point. And obviously, look, I think in order to be successful at advocating for issues in Congress, you got to be able to come at it from different ways. Um, this is something that traditionally has a enjoys some pretty warm support from Democrats. The issue, as you said, is kind of how do you how do you make sure there's a pot of money there when we're in a fiscally constrained environment? Um, there's some real champions on this. There have been in the past, and um, you know, I. I I find the, the messages that are effective, and, and you don't have to convert all that many people on it, are talking about some of the, the structural injustices and inadequacies there. And, you know, I, look, I was stunned as a prosecutor to arraign somebody for domestic, domestic violence charge and then sit down and then have a victim have to go it on on their own to try to get a restraining order, because that's a civil proceeding. Um, and to that, for oftentimes to have them get cross-examined without anybody there helping them out. And trying to talk through some of our colleagues about how those structures work and how they don't and what those shortcomings are, I think is critically important. The other piece that I would say, um, and Susan has been great on this, but is, is trying to think of if you happen to be um, another member with other priorities or that isn't exposed to this, how can you make this case, um, how can you get it to resonate with them? The New York Times did an article a couple of months ago now um, where it talked about the, the need for legal aid and what legal services actually provide. And one of the stories they just slipped in was how a family in Oklahoma was getting their farm foreclosed on because of a clerical error by a county official that ended up being a mistaken tax lien that they didn't pay because they didn't have a tax lien that the county was then moving to foreclose on. And they didn't have, they couldn't get access to a lawyer. They didn't know what else to do. They end up getting legal services. And the legal services attorney discovered the mistake and was able to actually save that family's farm and save their home. Um, I went up to a member from, a uh, pretty conservative member from Oklahoma, and handed them that story and said, do you know anything about legal services? He said, eh, sort of. And I said, it's the best thing you've got, your, your last defense against an overbearing government to make sure that you're protected by the rule of law. <laughs> and he said, great, I'm on. <laughs> Whatever it takes. I bet that was Mark Wayne Mullen. It was Mark. Okay. <laughs> so, and I say that because uh, we all serve on Energy and Commerce Committee together, and I think these two guys might work out in the morning together. I am not part of that workout crowd, um, but uh, but but it is those kind of relationships and sharing the stories. And yes, Mark Wayne probably doesn't think of what does Oklahoma. Um, have in common his family farm uh, family with constituents that uh, Joe represents or that I might represent in more urban Indianapolis. Um, but those are the types of stories that really do make a difference for our colleagues. Um, I would say um, in, so from a conservative standpoint, um, the focus is on smaller government, but yet it is also about making sure that there are efficiencies in the system 
And I think if anyone, and, and there are a lot of lawyers in Congress, okay? There are. Um, more, I would say, who practice in the civil arena than the criminal arena. Um, but I would say that um, anyone who's been a lawyer or a judge, and we also have a lot of judges in Congress, actually, they know that in any courtroom, um, a judge wants there to be an efficient and fair system. Almost all judges uh, but want it to be an efficient and fair system. And um, pro se litigants do not um, equal fair and efficient systems. Um, and they really do, as lawyers and judges will say, clog the courts. They can actually cause more and costlier litigation. Um, it, it's often the judge has to spend or his staff or her staff a lot of time helping that litigant in the system. It's just not a fair and efficient system. Um, but I think that when it comes to the funding issues, we have to take, honestly, those types of stories that Joe just shared to try to ensure colleagues realize how important this is and that it is. Um, what I loved about that Justice Gap report, they actually lifted a quote from Justice Scalia about the importance of equal justice under the law. I don't think this is a liberal or a conservative um, issue. It is an issue about equality and fairness and trying to ensure that our colleagues understand how important, especially for those who are not lawyers, because if you're not a lawyer and you've never had the need for legal services, a lot of people don't know that it exists or that it's needed. And so I think it's up to the legal profession and up to the bar to educate the general public about the need for these services. Everyone knows that if you go to a hospital or go to most clinic, I mean, if you go to a hospital, you're going to be cared for. People don't know, people believe that things, um, that, you know, if they go into a court, things are going to be fair and, and that justice will be, you know, meted out, that there will be justice. That doesn't necessarily happen, but unless you are involved in the court system, you just don't know these things. And so I think it's up to the bar to educate the general public beyond the bar. And that doesn't happen enough. Thank you for those messages. We probably have time for one question. So who is the lucky person? Um, we will go right there. Yep. One thing I'll share with you, um, believe it or not, and you might be seeing it, um, there aren't enough immigration judges in the country. And uh, so in funding for immigration uh, issues, um, immigration judges and um, those who work on immigration cases, there aren't nearly enough lawyers who work on those kind of cases. When I was US attorney um, from 01 to 07, uh, Maine Justice needed all of our offices to work on immigration issues. Um, so we have never focused enough um, resources at any level of whether it's on behalf of the government, whether it is representing those seeking asylum, seeking refugee status, or other immigration status issues, or whether it's judges. We are not focusing on that enough as a system. Um, it is in funding requests, um, but it, it's, a, it's a very difficult issue that I think causes the immigration system to become, when I talked about clogged systems, it is incredibly clogged because the lines are so long for people to have their matters adjudicated. And we don't have nearly the, the resources for the system. Only thing I'd add to that is that the immigration code, I think, is second in length only to the tax code. Right. It is extremely long. It's extremely complex. These cases are extreme, extremely personal, and they're very high stakes. And so our office gets a lot of, um, we, we do a lot of constituent casework. It's the fundamental responsibility of a member of Congress, a uh, Democrat or Republican, to help folks that, that have an issue with the federal system. We do an awful lot of, a lot, a lot of that kind of input is immigrate, our immigration issues, but my office can't, they're not immigration attorneys. 
right? And, and they can't be. They can help you try to push you to the right spot. But when push comes to shove, given the complexity and what's at stake, you need, for many of these folks, there might be a way given uh, detailed knowledge of the code and exceptions and the rest of it, um, <clears throat> where you might be able to find a way to, to successfully resolve whatever issue you have, but you need access to a lawyer. Um, and so I, it's one of, uh, that is one of the examples at the moment that I think is particularly relevant about um, exposing how um, complex and convoluted and uh, this system can be without those adequate resources. Yeah, that matches the experience of students here working on asylum cases. They say if you have a lawyer, it's 10 times as much of a chance of being fairly done as if you don't um, for students at Harvard Law that went down to the border. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, other questions out there? Great, right there. She's great. <laughs> it happens more than you might realize. It does. That so, is true. Uh, on this specific issue, it seems to touch, um, and both of you have mentioned this, um, simplifying the system and, and criminal justice reform, which has been like one of the two of the few areas where it seems that Republicans and Democrats, especially in the, even on the far left and far right of the party, seem to be working together. So, I guess the question is on, on the macro level, what kind of progress? I guess expect in the next three to four years, and what kind of, you know, what can we do as citizens and future lawyers and we to try and help out and push the majority of those parties to get it done? Well, as Joe said, um, believe it or not, and I had no idea, I had not worked on the Hill, I had not worked in a congressional office, so when I came to Congress, in 2013. Now, Joe has a little history in his family, okay? He yeah. has, he knew what he was walking into. Uh, I didn't come from a political family at all. Uh, I come from a family of educators, but I had no idea, for instance, in my first year in Congress that I would receive about 100,000 calls, emails, um, te you know, telephone calls, emails, constituent touches. I had no idea that kind of volume was received in our offices. To his point that we have staff who work on behalf of constituents, primarily when they have issues with federal government, whether it's immigration issues, IRS issues, veterans issues, we have staff that work on that. Um, we pay attention, and in fact, it gets cataloged into a system as to who is calling in on various issues. And I have to share with you that I get very few calls on civil legal aid. I get very few calls on criminal justice reform. Um, and so if we're getting very few calls and we care about those issues, and in fact, Joe and I helped start with some other former prosecutors, a prosecutor working group to talk about criminal justice reforms, um, constituents, citizens aren't reaching out to us on these issues. And so again, I think it could be the voice of the legal community to raise this issue to the forefront of average Americans, you know, uh, to make it a priority for the country. Um, and we just don't hear from them. We don't hear from our constituents on this issue. Um, I, I hear from federal judges. I hear occasionally from lawyers as I run in them, into them. But you have to also remember that lower income Americans don't often have um, very strong voices. They aren't taking the time to pick up the phone and to call us about their issues or about their needs. So it is incumbent upon other citizens, I think, to be their voice. So I agree, obviously, with uh, everything Susan said. I think um, there was a discussion about criminal justice reform. Um, I, we'll have to see kind of where that goes. Um, and while there is potentially an overlap on the far left and the far right, there's still, you know, there's a, we've, we've put together that, um, Two Democrats, two Republicans, I founded that prosecutor's working group thinking that if there was launch kind of federal, former federal and state law enforcement officials that could get behind some principles on what criminal justice reform should look like, that would help guide that conversation. We didn't agree on much, right? Um, and so that's just, it's, it's hard. Um, that being said, <clears throat> I do think the pathway forward for a lot of this is actually kind of thinking about it a little bit differently. Um, there's programs through AmeriCorps, right, that actually provide legal services. There's 
uh, one of the great innovations that has happened of late are the medical legal partnerships. So you get in community health centers, um, lawyers that are working there because when somebody comes in with an asthma issue, yeah, you've got asthma, but you've got asthma that's being triggered because of mold. And mold's actually a legal issue. So I can just give you an inhaler. That's not going to stop the problem. Somebody comes in because a child's exposed to lead paint. Well, now you've got a big problem, but that's also a, that's a legal problem. That's a housing problem. You've got issues on whether it's domestic violence or nutrition or whatever else. Putting legal aid attorneys or lawyers embedded in healthcare delivery systems actually can address some of the structural uh, constraints that might otherwise continue to lead people down to unhealthy outcomes. The transition from healthcare delivery from a fee-for-service based system to one that restructures those incentives actually helps shift that and look, provides potential breeding ground for more opportunities like that just in healthcare. Mental health, sorry, mental health has been a big issue for me as well. A lot of those issues you might say, okay, well that's healthcare. Well, there's a big legal component to that part too, right? Um, one of the hardest parts about trying to, Susan was 100% right about um, the struggles with uh, communities that are disenfranchised because they struggle to make their voices heard because quite candidly, they don't have the time to take a trip down to Washington to lobby their congressman. Why? Because you're trying to care for your kid and keep a job and not default on your mortgage. And you don't really have any time to do anything but that. So there's opportunities through actually some of those aspects of mental health reform of saying, how can we equip, look at that as a system analysis, and rather than just trying to triage that next thing, actually structure this so that you've got folks that might be being denied coverage under mental health parity, that that's actually a legal issue, despite the fact that you see that as a healthcare issue? Well, that, there's a federal law in place saying that those structures have to be equal. And if they're not, now that's a legal problem. So can we equip people to try to get access to make those claims heard and navigate their way through the most convoluted and complex process about insurance claims that there is period in the system at all across our country? So there's other ways to kind of look at some of this that I think is where, to Susan's point about saying, look, yes, I think we can do more on the federal funding side, but we have to look at some additional opportunities here that are going to enable people to get access to the legal remedy that they actually merit, even though they don't necessarily think of it that way and don't even know that that remedy exists. Two great messages. One, let's have legal services in more venues, not just in the legal venue. Let's put them in medical areas, other community places. And the other is the legal, uh, the legal system. We need to speak out. I'm sure there are lawyers in your districts. I'm sure there are bar offices in your districts. That's why we started SaveTheLSC.org which was, <laughs> I got a text from Alexa in the middle. <laughs> uh, that's why we started savethelsc.org, which was a way that we want law students there. I'm sure there are law students in each of your districts that can speak out on it, and we have ways that you can write to your Congress people at savethelsc.org. One more thing on that. Um, so the Legal Services Corporation, the, they have done an amazing job, and John Levi, the, the chair of it, of trying to broaden this message. They actually had a... Um, <laughs> They got Jim Harbaugh to actually join the board, and he had a ceremony before uh, kickoff at University of Michigan at Ann Arbor on, I guess it was last Saturday, um, highlighting the need for legal services and had two of our colleagues down there on the field in front of 100,000 people, uh, which isn't necessarily the thing that you'd think of before a U Michigan <laughs> game. Um, but, you know, Susan and I can harp on this stuff a lot. Harbaugh did like one tweet about it, and it got far more resonance than anything else we ever would have done. <laughs> um, so changing the, the narrative on us and changing the messengers is actually a hugely important thing. Who knows how many degrees away we are from other Harbaugh's out there. So if you put the word out as a student, who knows who it'll get to, and it could, uh, it could uh, get a lot of people knowing this. Any final words, one sentence on what message you have for young people to fight on this issue? Get involved. You really can change. The, you, you are the solution. You and fellow law students across the country are the solution in changing the way we deal with this equal access to justice issue in the country. Thank you. The only thing I'd add on to this legal services or whatever else, um, if you do not step up and try to address this problem or whatever else it is, Either, I would argue, no one else is going to, or somebody else is, and they're not going to do nearly as good a job as you might. Um, and if you think that these challenges are going to resolve themselves, you're out of your mind. 
Um, <laughs> so I say this um, in this community with all of you here that um, have ex extraordinary pressures in front of you between getting out of law school and then those paying off those loans and families and everything else that you're going to go do. I would also put that challenge to you as well to say, if you're, um, you all have such incredible capacity to, to, to think thing, these things through and to look at these structures and to try to address them, and if we don't, um, somebody else is, society probably is going to ignore it, and if they're not going to ignore it, somebody else is going to take advantage of it. Um, and so I'd ask you to, to give that some serious thought as well. We need your help. Let's get to work. Representative Susan W. Brooks and Joe Kennedy III, thank you for coming to the